Okay. Oh, well, thank you, everyone, for coming again uh, this week to this course. Um, a couple of things I wanted to talk about before going back to the lecture that I didn't finish uh, last time. So we are somewhere in the middle of lecture four. I think I have remembered where we are, but I'll check with you to make sure. Um, before we do that, um, I wanted to point out a story that I read this morning on the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation's website uh, that I've downloaded and put in in the uh, Google Documents or in the Google Classroom. And the title of the story is Will Russia Ever Leave Fossil Fuels Behind? Um, I found it a very interesting article because it gave me more of a background on what Russia's energy policies and what its options are for the future. And I think uh, I recommend that you have a look at it. And when we get to the last part of the course, when we talk about storage and system integration, um, we can use this article to talk about the Russian context of, of that material. So as I said, I put it up um, in in Google Classroom. I'm not going to say anything more about it for the moment, but I invite you to, um, to have a look at that. The other thing that I wanted to uh, tell you about before I go back to the lecture is to make another use of SAM. Now, remember that SAM is the uh, system advisor model, the NREL, uh, freely available software that can be used for renewable energy projects. We've already done uh, a very simple uh, or very quick run through what it can do for photo photovoltaics. What I want to do now is just tell you very briefly how it does calculations for wind energy, uh, because that fits in very neatly with what we've been looking at in lectures. So if we take uh, wind as our uh, technology, again, as I did with financial, with the photovoltaics, I'm not going to talk about the project costs and return on investments and whatever. We can look at that later. So I'll click on no financial model. And then the uh, um, SAM takes us to a wind resource section, just like it does for the solar energy. It takes us to a place where all its data for wind is uh, located in a database. Unfortunately, all the information that's easily available is only for the US. So when I uh, use uh, SAM for wind turbine calculations, I use the other option that they have. So you can see up on the top here, it says wind resource file, which would allow you to select one of these sites in the US or download um, data for other sites. I don't think it uh, covers uh, Russia because, as it says here, uh, continental US locations only. There's a lot of wind atlases available on the web that do have information for Russia, but I haven't looked in detail at those yet. The alternative to using a wind resource file is to specify the uh, wind speed probability distribution. And I mentioned the Weibull distribution in the class uh, yesterday because that is the most common uh, probability distribution for the wind speed that is used in the wind industry. Um, there's no uh, law of nature or no detailed reason why the Weibull distribution describes wind statistics. It just happens to be a good approximation for many sites in the world. Um, the Weibull distribution is a two-parameter distribution. It depends on the average annual wind speed, and this is the default value in, um, in SAM, 7.25 metres per second. We can change that to uh, any other value that we want, say 11 metres per second, as for the example of the V164 
turbine. But let me take let me take it back to seven meters per second because that is still a relatively healthy speed. Uh, we need to know the reference height uh, for the wind speed measurement because one of the things that I haven't told you about yet is that wind speed usually increases with height above the ground. So if you have seven metres per second at 50 metres, you will have a larger wind speed normally at, uh, at say, 100 metres or 140 metres, uh, which are typical tower heights for the very large modern turbines. I'll talk a little bit about the height variation of wind speeds later on in these lectures, I think in the next lecture. And the other parameter that appears in the Weibull distribution is uh, a K factor or a shape factor, it's sometimes called. If I change that shape factor, I change the shape of the distribution. And um, what has been found is that for many sites around the world where the Weibull distribution is a good approximation to the measured wind speed distribution, uh, this factor has a value of around two. And I think one of the main reasons that the Weibull distribution is used is that uh, you can approximate the wind speed distribution as soon as you know the average wind speed. So if you know the average wind speed and nothing else about a site, um, you can assume a K factor of two, and that gives you the probability distribution. So what we have is, um, strictly speaking, a probability distribution. It shouldn't be called likelihood uh, versus wind speed. So the probability distribution, the, the speed is at that particular value. And the value of that is that we combine that with the power curve for the particular wind turbine. So the next thing that happens in SAM is that you have to select the turbine. So if we go to the turbine page, this is very similar to the database that's in SAM for photovoltaic modules. I'm going to change the hub height to 140 metres because um, I'm going to see if I can find uh, the Vestas V80 or the V164 turbine, and I think it's down the bottom here. So there, there we go there. Um, what is coming up here that you can see on the screen is the power curve for the Vestas uh, V164 turbine. This is a big 80-metre uh, long blade turbine that we looked at yesterday with the uh, manufacturer specifications. So the power curve that you see in SAM is exactly the same as the power curve that we were looking at yesterday. And you can see, for example, when we get to 25 metres per second, the wind speed, uh, the turbine shuts down. So basically, all you need to do the simplest of the wind turbine calculations is to combine that power curve with the probability distribution of the wind speed. And when I do that by clicking simulate, then this is the result. Um, we get the annual energy production that I talked about uh, yesterday, how many kilowatt hours uh, produced each year. Uh, we get the capacity and the capacity factor. And remember, the capacity factor was introduced in lecture one. It is the average power output divided by the rated power. So this eight megawatt turbine uh, would produce on average a bit over three megawatts. And you can get the distribution into the months of the year. There's more sophisticated stuff in the wind turbine module, similar to what's in the photovoltaic modules that allows you to deal with the different forms of losses that occur when wind turbines are grouped together. But this is just a very simple demonstration of why the power curve is important because it is one of the two pieces of information that you need to determine how a wind turbine will operate at a particular site. But of course, you also need the wind resource at that site. And this Weibull distribution uh, with a possibly a known average wind speed um, and K factor is the easiest way of doing that.
So, for example, um, to determine the variation of annual energy production versus wind speed for the Vestas V164, all you need to do is rerun the SAM uh, simulations for a change in the average wind speed. So, so that's that's um, a bit of a background on why we're looking at uh, power curves and uh, wind speed distributions at site. So I'll finish there and um, I will get out of SAM. I haven't, I um, don't want to save any changes and I'll go to the lecture. We're still on lecture four and where we got to yesterday, uh, if I just, if I share the screen um, is here and I'll turn that into presentation mode where, where, where we were talking about the power curve, uh, typical power curve for a wind turbine. Obviously, the details of the power curve change with um, the make of the turbine and its rating, but the general form of the power curve uh, is uh, universal. Um, this one doesn't show the shutdown at 25 metres per second. I truncated that to get it onto one page, but you can see the cut-in wind speed, the region where the, wind, the power output varies rapidly uh, with wind speed. And I talked a little bit about this region here, which is called the shoulder of the power curve, just like, just like a human shoulder. Um, and that is where the control system changes its mode of operation. In this region here, say between 5 and 10 metres per second, the power output is nearly cubic in wind speed. And I asked you yesterday if you could explain the reason for that. So in this, um, I'll get back to that question uh, at the end, either at the end of the lecture today or at the beginning of next week's lecture, next, next Wednesday's lecture. Um, this is the region where the turbine spends most of its life. Um, on, for an onshore wind farm, a good average wind speed would be seven and a half metres per second. Uh, which means that probably for something like 90% of the turbine's operational life, it is seeing wind speeds between about 5 and 10 metres per second. This is a region where you want to get the absolute maximum possible amount of power out of the turbine. And how the control system does that, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, after this, prob probably next week. Um, when we get up towards, uh, in this case, about 15 metres per second, which is the rated speed for this wind turbine, the control strategy has to change because when we're getting up to these wind speeds, we become concerned about the safety and the integrity of the turbine. So the turbine is controlled that when it gets to 15 metres per second or greater, the power output remains constant. Um, that's because we don't want to overload the generator and we don't want to put very large structural loads on the wind turbine. And one of the key aspects of wind turbine design is how to manage this part of the power curve here. And in fact, Probably most time in the research and development and the design of a new wind turbine goes into how to deal with this region here, the shoulder of the power curve, where you're changing your control strategy from an aggressive chasing of the maximum possible power to this constant power as the wind speed increases. And like I said, I'll talk a little bit later on about how the control system does that. Okay, so I just put this slide in there to, to remind me to show you a SAM calculation. Um, here's the formula for the Weibull distribution. Um, if K equals 2, the distribution reduces to what's called a Rayleigh distribution. And you can see the factor K and you can see the factor C, which is related to the average wind speed. Sometimes an average wind speed is given by U with a subscript zero. Sometimes it's given by a U with an overbar on it to denote a time average. 
And mathematically, the situation, the, the theory is extremely simple. If we want to compute the average power output, we simply integrate the product of the uh, power curve and, sorry, the probability distribution of the wind speed and uh, the power curve, okay? And I think this is so simple that it's not worth uh, trying to prove it. Okay, um, and that means that the capacity factor it also comes out of that calculation because it's simply the ratio of the average power divided by the, <clears throat> excuse me, the rated power of the turbine. Okay, I'm going to tell you now a little bit about uh, wind turbine blades and how they're designed and uh, whatever. And one of the interesting features of wind turbine blades is that uh, even though their primary job is to extract power from the wind, to change, to convert the kinetic energy of the wind into electrical power, um, it us a, a blade usually has to satisfy a number of multidimensional criteria. One very important thing is that uh, wind turbines can't make much noise. Noise is a very important uh, part of the social acceptability of wind farms. And again, I'll talk a little bit about wind farm, wind turbine and wind farm noise later. One of the biggest sources of noise is the tip of a wind turbine. And that noise is associated with the formation of a trailing vortex behind the turbine blade. And again, I'll talk a little bit about trailing vortices later on. Um, most, most modern large wind turbines have um, what I call a shark fin shape. You know, shark is uh, the nasty uh, fish um, that has a sort of an arch shape. And that shape is designed to spread out the shedding of the flow from the blades to form the trailing vorticity in a way that minimises the noise of a wind turbine. So that right at the tip of the turbine, uh, the blade is designed purely to uh, produce low noise. Um, if we move inboard a little bit from the tip, we come to the region where most of the power is produced. And so this part of the blade here, the outer 20 or 30%, depending on how you define it, uh, is going to be designed primarily for power extraction. Um, if you design for power extraction, it's very easy to show that under simple assumptions, the cord of the blade, the width of the blade, uh, is inversely proportional to the radius for, or the distance from the axis of rotation. So that should mean that if you have an optimal blade for maximising the power output, then the cord of the blade is going to follow the white line here. And you can see why real blades don't do that because this blade is on a truck. This blade is being taken to a wind farm on the back of the truck. If you followed the ideal cord distribution for maximum power, then you probably wouldn't be able to get that blade under a bridge or something like that on the way to, <clears throat> to the uh, wind farm where it's going to be installed. So there's a practical limitation on how wide a wind turbine blade can be. When we get down to the bottom part of the blade, the hub section of the blade, um, this is where the blade is joined to the hub of the turbine. And so the uh, images that I showed you yesterday about the, um, the nacelle and what's in the nacelle of a wind turbine, you can imagine uh, the blade being attached uh, to that hub. And that attachment is circular. Okay. And it's circular because a blade has to be able to pitch, that is, rotate around that circular adjustment for reasons that I'll talk about uh, at the, in the rest of the lecture. Also, too, this is where the structural loads are most important because, to a good approximation, a wind turbine blade is a cantilever beam. 
okay? It's rigidly fixed at this point here, but nowhere else along the blade. And it has a pressure distribution along the blade that is bending the blade backwards. And the maximum uh, loads in terms of root bending moment of the blade occur in this region here. So uh, this region is designed largely for structural strength and the attachment to the hub. Okay, unfortunately, we don't have enough time in this course to go through in detail the aerodynamics of wind turbine blades, which I would love to do uh, because that's my primary research area and I like telling people about it. But um, if I told you about it, we would probably be having lectures till Christmas next year, not Christmas this year. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an idea about how wind turbine blades are analysed and what that analysis does. Um, we use a combination of what is called momentum theory and blade element theory. And momentum theory is basically the ideas that I introduced in the last lecture that lead to the betz stukowski limit. So we assume that the flow uh, is, you can see the direction of this big arrow here. This is the wind direction. Here is the wind turbine here. And the gray area is the disc that is equal to the swept area of the blades. So the analysis that we did uh, yesterday using the actuator disc model is just assuming the blades can be represented by that um, blade disc. So this drawing here shows the flow that actually goes through the blades. So the wind speed decreases as we go towards the blade. The flow area therefore has to expand. And that expansion continues behind the turbine uh, till we get to what's usually called the far wake, uh, where no further development occurs. And this is, this is a model uh, for the extraction of power from a wind turbine that gives us the betz joukowsky limit. Um, and in what follows here, um, I, yesterday I used u naught for the wind speed. Um, sometimes I will be calling it v naught as I do here because I'm taking information from a number of different sources. And also I've used omega large omega for the angular velocity of the blades. Uh, in this diagram, that appears as, as small or lowercase omega. They're all they're equivalent. Okay, so this model, this one-dimensional model based on momentum theory uh, that leads to the betz joukowsky limit is extremely important because the betz joukowsky limit gives us an upper limit on the performance of a wind turbine and therefore gives us a way of telling how good our wind turbine design is in terms of power extraction. However, and if you look back through the derivation that I went through yesterday, that derivation tells us nothing about how to design the blades or what is it about the geometry of the blades that gives us good performance. In order to do that, we have to use uh, in the simplest form, a theory called blade element theory. And the idea of blade element theory is to take this picture uh, or this model for the flow through a wind turbine and split it down into a number of uh, separate control volumes. And these control volumes are annulus, so they are annular at a particular radius, little r, and each of those annular stream tubes intersects the blades. If we have three blades, it intersects the blades three times, and that intersection defines a blade element. That is what is meant by a blade element. And you can probably appreciate that this division of uh, this flow into the annular stream tubes and blade elements is very well suited for a very simple uh, computational model for how wind turbine blades behave. So if we look at a blade element, 
say this one here, and we look at it in cross-section, in grey here is the blade element. The rotor plane is the plane of rotation of the blade element. So this blade element is moving to the left at a speed equal to omega times r. In addition to that, there is the component of the velocity in the direction of the axis of rotation, and that is this velocity here. And you can see, in addition to this, these velocities, v naught and omega times r, you can see the symbol A, and that A is exactly the same uh, symbol that I used yesterday in deriving the best Joukowsky limit. Uh, v naught into 1 minus A is actually the axial velocity at the blade element because the wind has slowed down by a factor of A between the uh, position well upwind of the turbine to all the blades. With the rotational velocity, we also have a, an in, an, what's called an induced velocity component. That is called A dash. And this is the circumferential induced velocity. Um, this is the hardest part of blade element theory to understand. Um, so I'm not going to say anything more about it because fortunately, at least for qualitative purposes, for a basic description of how wind turbines behave, we can assume this is equal to zero. So I'm going to neglect uh, this component of the circumferential velocity. But of course, the Betts uh, Joukowsky derivation shows us that the axial factor is important because this factor has a value of one, one over three when we get maximum performance from the Betts Joukowsky limit. So we can't ignore this. So what we have here is the velocity triangle. Uh, for that blade element. The axial velocity uh, added vectorially to the circumferential velocity gives us the relative velocity. Um, you can see the chord line through the blade element, which joins the trailing edge to the leading edge. And that chord line is at an angle theta to the rotor plane. And that angle is called the pitch angle of the blade. And that pitch angle changes along the blade, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, it is larger near the hub, and it goes to typically values of zero near the tip of the blade. The angle between the chord line and the relative velocity uh, defines an angle alpha, which is the angle of attack. And that angle of attack has the same meaning for a wind turbine blade element as it does for an airfoil because that, that uh, angle alpha um, allows us to say that there's going to be a lift force on that blade element at right angles to the relative velocity and there's going to be a drag force in the same direction as that relative velocity. Okay, so the basic assumption of blade element theory is that the blade elements behave as airfoils. And so that means that's a very, very important approximation or assumption because it allows us to use a large amount of information that's available for airfoil behavior uh, to design wind turbine blades. And what I've shown here is the lift at right angles to the relative velocity and the drag parallel to the relative velocity. That is the definition of lift and drag in, in, in aerodynamics. Um, and if you think that the blade is uh, moving to the left on this diagram here, you can see that the torque that is generated on that blade element which gives rise to the power that's extracted from the wind is generated by the lift and is reduced by the drag. So I've shown the lift in green because green is a good color. And I've shown the drag in red because it's a bad color. 
okay? That basic behaviour of the lift and drag vectors is critical to wind turbine operation because it is a lift that is giving rise to the torque that is causing the blade element to rotate and that torque is reduced by the drag. Okay, that is a basic principle of design for a wind turbine blade. A wind turbine blade is made out of airfoils because an airfoil has a very large lift to drag ratio. And I'll give you some examples of that later. So we want, we want the blade to be made out of airfoils so we can maximize the lift to the drag. And I need to say at this point that when I drew the uh, lift and drag vectors, I have exaggerated the size of the drag vector. This is much, much bigger than what it would be proportionally to the lift vector in reality. A good airfoil will have a lift to drag ratio of about 150. So this vector will be about 150 times as long as this vector. I've only, I've drawn it this way because if I drew it to scale, you probably wouldn't be able to see the drag vector. But the basic idea that lift is giving us the torque that extracts the power from the wind and the drag is reducing that torque is fundamental because it means that the best design for a blade element is an airfoil that maximizes the lift to drag ratio. And if you write that down, the mathematics of it down, it's it's quite straightforward, but it also shows you very clearly that we have to maximize lift to drag ratio. So what that means is shown uh, very roughly in this diagram here. Um, so we have lift and drag and we have the angle of attack and we have the velocity at the blade, the circumferential velocity at the blade. And the basic principle is that a blade element at radius R is equivalent to an airfoil at the same angle of attack. And just to emphasize that, I've reproduced uh, the photograph that I showed before of the section through the wind turbine blade. Now, this is clearly an airfoil. And now you know the reason why. So if we define the tip speed ratio, um, or we look again at the tip speed ratio, the circumferential velocity of the blade tip divided by the wind speed, we start to see the significance of the tip speed ratio. The tip speed ratio controls the aerodynamics of the blade. By that, I mean if we keep a constant pitch angle of the blade, that's that, then the only way we can change the angle of attack is to change the tip speed ratio. That's why the tip speed ratio after the power coefficient, the tip speed ratio is the most parameter that describes wind turbine performance. Okay, just a little bit of information on airfoil behavior. We're interested in lift and we're interested in drag. And what I've shown here is conventional lift and drag coefficients. Um, I, you know, some of you will have learned some hydrodynamics and fluid mechanics. If you do, you know that in those disciplines, we love to talk about non-dimensional numbers. We talk about power coefficients and tip speed ratios, all quantities that have no dimension. Uh, the lift and the drag coefficients are simply non-dimensionalizations of the lift and the drag. We're not particularly bothered by them individually because down here you see the ratio of lift and to drag. And I've, draw, I've got this data for a range of Reynolds numbers. Um, if you know about Reynolds numbers, you'll appreciate the significance of the Reynolds numbers in terms of the variation in the lift and drag. If you don't know about Reynolds numbers, all you need to know is that large wind turbine blades operate at high Reynolds numbers, usually greater than 10 to the fifth. And at high Reynolds numbers, the lift is approximately linear in angle of attack and the drag for that region is roughly constant. If we move over here to the lift to drag ratio, you see what I was saying before. 
that um, you can get very high values of the lift to drag ratio. It is Reynolds number dependent, and that is primarily a problem for small wind turbines because they intrinsically have lower Reynolds numbers. And you can see how the lift to drag ratio decreases with decreasing Reynolds number. The other important point from here is the angle at which that maximum occurs. Typically, between five and 10 degrees angle of attack. Virtually every airfoil that I know that has been used on a wind turbine has its maximum lift to drag ratio at uh, a, somewhere between six and seven degrees. Okay. Okay, so last quantity to talk about is the blade pitch angle, which is the uh, angle between the direction of rotation and the uh, cord line of the blade element. And that means that if we want to maintain high lift to drag, this angle alpha has to be close to constant across a wind turbine blade. So what that means is that uh, for small u or large r times omega, where r is the radius, the angle must be small. Uh, when r omega is small or u is large, uh, the angle must be large. So this is the situation near the tip of the blade. Remember, typical tip speed ratios for commercial wind turbines are around about eight, okay? Um, down near the hub, of course, our omega goes to zero. So down near the hub, the uh, pitch angle must be large. That is predicated or that assumes that we're operating at approximately a constant angle of attack across the blade, which is generally true. Even if the, as what happens on a large wind turbine blade, uh, the airfoil sections change as you go out along the blade, but the angle that, we're up, that we want doesn't change as much as the sections change. So there's a, there's a very simple um, description of why the pitch angle of, the, of a wind turbine blade is important. In terms of turbine control, uh, pitch variation, a, a variation in angle beta across the whole blade, that only occurs at high wind speeds. Um, pitch actuation of a wind turbine blade usually only occurs at the shoulder of the power curve. And it's a main mechanism that the turbine control system uses to get the power out to put to remain constant as the wind speed changes. This is at high uh, wind speed. Okay, and again, I'm just saying the same thing, showing the uh, typical variation in the magnitude of the vectors. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of the aerodynamic performance of a wind turbine blade? Uh, we have the power coefficient, which is a standard definition here, which is limited by the betts jukowski limit, and we have the tip speed ratio. So uh, if we're looking at the aerodynamic performance of a wind turbine blade, then we plot the power coefficient versus the tip speed ratio. And obviously, when tip speed ratio is equal to zero, the power coefficient is equal to zero, as we saw uh, yesterday. As the tip speed ratio increases, we reach a maximum of the power coefficient. And then as the tip speed ratio increases further, uh, we uh, the maximum, uh, sorry, the CP reduces from the maximum. Now, what I would like you to do uh, for the next few moments is think about what happens to the angles of attack on the blade as the tip speed ratio is increasing from zero? Okay. If the tip speed ratio is zero, then at any section of the blade, the angle of attack is maximized. Okay. The, if, you, if there's no pitch adjustment on a wind turbine blade, the maximum angles of attack occur when the blade is not rotating. As the blade starts rotating, and you can think about the components of the velocity triangle uh, that gives rise to the angle of attack, 
As the tip speed ratio increases, the angle of attack reduces. So the angle of attack goes down as the tip speed ratio increases. At some point, we reach the angle of attack that gives us maximum lift to drag. Okay, and that's that point there. If we increase the tip speed ratio, the angles of attack decrease, and that gives us, again, a reduction in performance. So here's a question for everybody. Um, here is the basic uh, operation of a wind turbine in terms of power coefficient to and tip speed ratio. How do I get from this curve to this curve? If this is the aerodynamic performance of the turbine in terms of the power coefficient versus tip speed ratio, how do I get uh, this? power curve here. You probably integrate something. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Um, what, what we need to think about first of all is the point of maximum CP. Okay. From the definition of the power coefficient, uh, if we can operate at the maximum CP, we're going to get the maximum amount of power. Okay, I think that's pretty pretty obvious. Okay, but the interesting and difficult part is that that requires the turbine to operate at a constant tip speed ratio. Okay, and the problem is that the tip speed ratio involves the angular velocity and the wind speed. So if we're going to operate at a constant tip speed ratio, at the optimal tip speed ratio that gives us a maximum power, we have to operate at a constant tip speed ratio. And we have to do that even though the wind speed is changing all the time. Okay. So the basic uh, feature of the control system for this region here is to try to keep the tip speed ratio constant as the wind speed changes. Okay, That is made very difficult by a simple fact, and that simple fact is that it is very difficult to measure U0 on an operating wind turbine. Uh, I told you yesterday that a wind turbine will have an anemometer and a wind vane on the nacelle to, and that will measure the anemometer will measure the wind speed but that is the wind speed after the flow has gone through the blades it's not the actual wind speed well away from the turbine so the control problem for a wind turbine is how to maintain constant tip speed ratio performance when the wind speed is not measured or can't be trusted if you do if you do measure it, and that's a, that's a real that's a really difficult part of wind turbine control because wind speeds change rapidly. You know they can they can change in in the matter of seconds between high values and low values and low values and high values. There's obviously considerable inertia in wind turbine blades when they're weighing thirty to fifty tons each, but it's still necessary for the control system to the, do the best possible matching of generator speed to wind speed to keep the tip speed ratio constant. And um, probably next week, I will tell you a little bit about how the control system uh, achieves that. And very interestingly, um, that control system or that, that method, it's called maximum power point tracking. So we want to keep the we want to keep finding the maximum power as our operating conditions change. That problem for wind turbines is very very similar to the problem for photovoltaics, because a photovoltaic system the power output depends on the radiation level and the ambient temperature. Uh, the temperature changes relatively slowly, but if a cloud passes over the sun, 
the power output from a PV, a photovoltaic system, will drop rapidly. So the time constants that you get in a PV system are actually much shorter than for wind turbines. And the way you adjust the operation of a PV system to also do maximum power point tracking is very similar to what they do for wind turbines. Okay, so that's the end of that lecture. Um, I'll start on the next one, but I'll pause for a moment just to see uh, if anybody has any uh, questions that they would like to ask. Now, there's there's uh, nothing coming up in the chat, so I'll move on to lecture five, uh, which is up on Google Classroom. And I used, whoops, I need to share the screen first. So you should be able to see the same slide that's introducing uh, lecture five to what I used for lecture uh, four. So I wonder if there's anything about those images that you understand a bit better now that uh, we have uh, done at least done one lecture on wind turbine. You can probably appreciate why this is a why. Whoops. I'll get my laser pointer going again. Where is it? Pointer options, laser pointer. You can probably appreciate now that this uh, is a low tip speed ratio, high torque machine, because for the same amount of power, the lower the tip speed ratio, the higher the torque. And when you need torque to drive a pump, uh, you need to operate at low tip speed ratios. Uh, you can see that one of the defining features of modern wind turbines that I haven't talked about yet is that the area of the blades uh, is much smaller than the swept area of the blades. So if we look at the projected area of these blades divided by the uh, disc, the circle that encloses the blade, we get a thing called the solidity. And the solidity for a modern large turbine is somewhere between 5 and 10%. And if you think about it for a moment, that means that each of these three blades is going to behave more or less independently of the other blades. The blades of this low multi-bladed windmill, uh, they, they're close enough together that the flow over one blade will affect the flow over another blade. But one of the assumptions that we make in blade element theory for wind turbines is that the blades are acting in, independently. And if you think about it, the assumption of airfoil behaviour is precisely that assumption. It's assuming that what happens to this blade is not directly influencing what is happening to the other blades. I forgot to mention the blade element theory is extremely simple. Um, I've got a number of computer programs that implement blade element theory. They're only two or three pages of MATLAB code, so they're, they're, they're not long. Um, blade element theory is not used uh, for the final design of large wind turbines, but it is often used for the initial part of uh, wind turbine blade design because it's so simple that you can do lots and lots of solutions uh, for it in a very short time. So in the context of, say, using genetic algorithms for multi-dimensional optimization, uh, blade element theory is a really good choice. Okay, so here's a very simple example about the blade pitch, uh, how it changes as we go out, uh, out along a blade. I forgot to uh, apologise, I've changed notation again. I'm using uh, this parameter or this variable, theta subscript P, to denote the pitch of the blade. And remember, the pitch is the angle between the cord line of the blade and the plane of rotation. And uh, let's take a case where uh, the turbine is operating as close as possible to the Betts-Joukowsky limit. So the value of A will be one, th one third. 
if we take the tip speed ratio as, as being seven, what is the pitch angle needed to achieve an angle of attack of six degrees at a quarter of a way along the blade compared to the tip of the blade? So this uh, value here uh, would be for an airfoil that has its maximum lift to drag ratio at that angle. And the arithmetic, it's, there's no mathematics in it, it's just arithmetic. Um, the blade element diagram uh, is defined by the ratio of the velocity at the blade to the wind speed, which is two thirds, and little r, the radius times omega divided by u naught is equal to 1.75, and we get a pitch angle of nearly 15 degrees. When we go out to the tip, that pitch angle has changed to uh, an, a slightly negative value. And the negative value of the pitch at the tip of a wind turbine blade is actually quite common. A lot of large wind turbines have that negative angle. And the difference, um, the axial velocity doesn't change. And in practice, uh, if you do detailed calculation of wind turbine flows, then you find that the axial component of the velocity does not change significantly as you go out along the blade. So this velocity is the same, but we have a factor of four different in the radius and the large value of the tip speed ratio. So there's a significant change in the circumferential velocity. And that change in the circumferential velocity is what drives the change in the pitch angle, okay? As I said, a very simple example, but one that gives you an understanding of one of the basic features of wind turbine blade design, and that is the fact that the pitch angle decreases as you go out along the blade. Okay, I'm going to move now from looking at the aerodynamic aspects of wind turbine blade operation to some of the issues with actually using a turbine for the production of power. Um, there are a number of, of safety issues that come up and um, one of the things that you can do to follow up on this is if you have some spare time, uh, go on to YouTube and in YouTube uh, uh, search for wind turbine failures. And if you do that, you'll find a lot of really interesting uh, images and videos, some of which I've used in this. Um, where there can be a problem with the tower, uh, but most of the problems that occur with wind turbines are associated with the blades because the blades are the rotating part of the turbine and can have a very large kinetic energy. Um, if, a blade, if a blade detaches from a wind turbine, that can be a major problem. Uh, if you operate a wind turbine in a cold climate like Siberia or Canada, uh, issues of ice shedding from the blade or ice being thrown from the blade, actually ice that accumulates on the blade surface actually being uh, flung away from the blades. Uh, for turbines, generally, there are community impacts. Noise is important and flicker is important. And what I mean by flicker, I'll show you in a short video in a couple of slides times. Um, there can be the visual impact of wind turbines. You know, they're, they're even, a, even a modern, even a wind turbine that is small by modern day standards is on an 80 meter tower and the blades will be another 40 meters above that tower at their maximum height. Um, some people don't like that. And so as part of the community acceptance uh, for wind turbines, uh, the developers of a wind farm have to pay attention to those issues. Then there can be environmental impacts uh, birds and bats. Interestingly, in southern Alberta, uh, most of the problems that we have uh, are with bats. And um, uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Calgary um, studied 
the effect of wind farms on bats a number of years ago. And they went to wind farms in southern Alberta and they collected dead bats from the ground around the wind turbines. And they collected something like 80 bats, nearly nearly 100 bats. And they found that none of those bats had any physical damage. Okay, so clearly none of those bats had actually hit a blade of the wind turbine. And so what came out of that study and a number of other studies is the idea that um, the, the bats are killed because they get close enough to a wind turbine blade that the pressure field of the blade affects their respiratory system and kills them. It's a very interesting theory. I think it is wrong myself, but it's it's a very interesting one. And it does point to the fact that particularly for uh, a renewable energy technology, we have to pay attention to those sorts of issues. So here are just some... Uh, sorry, uh, uh, is it uh, noisy? I mean, can it be due to the noise because maybe bats are sensitive to the um, overall noise? That, I'm just, that, I just don't know how, how the turbine sound, sounds like. That, that, that is very possible. So it could be some sort of trauma due to the noise. The other thing which my, my personal theory, and I've got no... Uh, scientific basis for this theory is that uh, wind turbine blades at the tip are traveling about 90 meters per second typically. And that is much faster than the speed of uh, the insects and other flying objects that the, the bats have to know about with their sonar system. And my as I said, it's just a personal theory. I think they just get information overload from uh, coming up or see, seeing uh, a, an object that is very large, much larger than what they're used to, um, and travelling much faster than than they are used to. So somehow that, that feeds into it. If you're interested in it, um, Rustam, I've got a paper that actually challenges the pressure field argument on the basis of uh, doing some computational fluid dynamic simulations of the pressure field and estimating what effect they would have on bats. So here, anyway, um, on to wind turbine failures. Here's some typical uh, failures that occur. Um, this particular image here is a from a famous video, unfortunately taken by a, um, a cell phone camera probably about 15 years ago. So it does not have high resolution or a large frame rate because if you go through this video image by image, um, the blade, one of the blades actually disintegrates between one image and the next. It's a, it's a pretty extraordinary uh, video. Um, there's at the top left, there's an example of ice that has detached from a wind turbine blade. Many of the uh, examples of wind turbine failures involve fires on the in the generator. They're the most spectacular. But these images here show some of the issues that are associated with cold climate operation of wind turbines, such as having to de-ice the blades, uh, probably uh, the icing occurred while the turbine uh, while the wind speed was quite low, so the blades were not rotating. And so in order to get the blades clean again to extract energy when the wind starts blowing, they had to actually de-ice it, which is also not a very good look for wind turbines. Um, most manufacturers now uh, provide different forms of heating of the blades to avoid having to rent a helicopter and the and um, some de-icing equipment, which would be very expensive. Okay, here's another turbine uh, failure. Um, this is actually quite a small turbine, but there are enough images here that I think I can figure out what is that, what actually happened 
uh, with this turbine. This was, um, I happened to be in England at the time and um, uh, I saw these images in the newspaper. So I went to the newspaper site and down and downloaded the images. Um, it's just, we've, we've just uh, come up to one hour. So I'm going to finish here. And I'm going to ask you in the audience to see if you can think through uh, what happened with this turbine. Uh, the, the, it occurred during a big storm. So that time that I was in England in, in 2012, uh, there was a very big storm went through the country and uh, a number of turbines failed in that storm. But I think there's a particular sequence of events that occurred to this particular turbine. So if you have a little bit of time uh, before next Tuesday, have a look at that question that I asked you about the interpretation of the power coefficient and think also about what might have happened to this wind turbine. And on Tuesday, uh, I'll tell you what I think uh, happened to it. Okay, so I will stop there. And uh, we're after, it's after half past. So I thank you for staying with me. And uh, we probably have time for some quick questions if anybody has any. I have a question with uh, what's going on with tip uh, ratio speed if we, if control system goes to the shoulder. So it, yes. is it, uh, yeah, it's, when we have the constant uh, power. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. When, when we get to the shoulder of the power curve, that is, that is when the pitch actuation occurs on the blades. Uh -huh. So uh, in the region where the power coefficient is increasing rapidly with wind speed, there's no pitch adjustment. At the shoulder of the power curve, that is when the blade is pitched to reduce the torque generated on the blade to keep uh, the power constant. Uh, it'll make a little bit more sense, I think, after the next lecture when I talk a little bit more about the control system. Okay, it's a it's a it's an interest it's a very interesting problem and clearly one that is critical to the ability of a wind turbine to survive uh, extreme environmental conditions. Okay. okay, so we'll take that keep that in your mind, Ivan, and we'll we'll uh, bring it up next week. Okay, so I think that I've stopped sharing the screen, haven't I, or not? Yes. So, uh, sorry, I was having trouble escaping from the video. Okay, I, I think uh, we have finished for the for the day and for the week. Um, so I will see everyone next Wednesday. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.